you were looking at the list of kings, Malaysian kings, Frankish kings, all of these kings are going to stem from a common tree. That is enough for me to say, if somebody was looking at this promise given to Jeremiah, the promise was not, not made good on. The promise was kept. And in fact, the promise is still ongoing. This is the wonder of when you study God's book. You can, you can find a few things that you think are just random coincidences, but when you start to see God's hand over and over and over and over again, it's really faith building and it, it kind of opens your eyes to the reality that God is not this um, black and white ink on the pages here, but actually living, breathing, powerful, has his hand in history, making all of this come to pass. <laughs> there is less of an ability for us to identify the tribe of Judah, the southern tribe, although we can identify some, we cannot identify all of them, but there's something that we can know. Um, you remember how important it was when Jacob, who is Israel, blesses his children. And in Genesis, he talks about for the tribe of Judah, basically saying that the scepter shall not, not depart, the right to rule, uh, the lawmaker between his feet until Shiloh come, until Christ return. So I want you to think of what was said there and then something that's said in Jeremiah, which you can read right by it. You can do the thing that I've probably done myself. God is speaking to Jeremiah, thus, for thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Now, did anybody pick up something really interesting? The right to rule, the scepter, right? The right to rule was essentially given to Judah, to the house of Judah, southern kingdom. Listen to what it says here, because you can read right by this. And basically what it's trying to say is you don't, Think of the word man. The Hebrew word is ish, which could denote ish or isha, man or woman. Um, basically, that they'll, there will not be a time that there will not be a seed or a descendant of David sitting on the throne, but read carefully, of the house of Israel. Did you catch that before? Because we can, you know, we can talk about Judah has the right to rule, and yes, there were kings ruling in Israel, but... That gives us a huge clue about who these people, when they become royalty or nobility, the sovereigns that are supposed to come out of the tribe of David, that gives us a big clue that they would not be uh, recognizable as part of the Judah clan, okay? Which basically, and I've referred to this over and over again, will make us look at specifically the English monarchy, uh, British monarchy, and many of the other uh, sovereigns that trace their line all the way back. And you have to conclude something. It did not say of the house of Judah, even though that will be, the house of Judah will be, Jerusalem will be the epicenter, future time for all the activity. But it says house of Israel, which there's that clue that says, if we are careful to read this aright, we know that the line descending from David, which is from the tribe of Judah, we did this before, we studied the children that were born to Judah out of the uh, interesting association with Tamar. And out of that union, the children that were produced, which we've already covered, um, Zara and Farah, Faraz, uh, twins in the womb, if you will. And this line is the line that basically bifurcates. A lot of times we tend to look at this subject and we think, well, for someone to be ruling on the throne of David, and I'm just going to not finish the sentence, we automatically think it must be the Faraz line. And the Pharaoh's line is what's chronicled for us when you read the genealogies in the New Testament. That's pretty much the Pharaoh's line. Zara line, three generations from First Chronicles, I believe, three or four, and then they disappear. 
but they didn't die, they just went somewhere else. So it's important to note that when it says that there basically won't be a time where there will not be an individual sitting on the throne of David for the house of Israel, that becomes a key factor to identifying when we talk about who are these people. And we trace these two lines. So Zara we saw as a descendant. We started tracing that line, Calcol or Chalcol, um, which we know both Calcol or Chalcol and Darda depart Egypt before the children of Israel go into Egypt's bondage. And we know that they take off and they depart. And we've got a whole chronicle, which I've already told you in many other messages, about these two individuals. And let's just say that we can trace them and follow them from Turkey to Greece and onward pretty much until we track them all the way to the farthest far-flung land. Ultimately, we're going to end up in the British Isles and Ireland. But the reason why I'm pointing this out is because I think a lot of people think when it says there must be someone sitting on the throne, it's actually a dual happening. It's not just a singular one. There is that which is happening on earth, which I would say is the bookmark, just like I've referred to modern day Israel as a bookmark, and a bookmark only to save the place until he whose right it is to rule and will rule comes again, and then it will be Israel as he portrays it, not as we would like to depict it or as we'd like it to be seen. And I think if you kind of look at all of this, it becomes important to trace these lines properly. So I started going down this pathway of trying to see, could we find the terminus on the Faraz line, and we do. If you read the New Testament, the terminus is Christ. He's basically, he will sit on the throne here. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. So there's that, when I say double happening, there's something here on earth, that's the bookmarker, and then there is the actuality. So I think a lot of people get confused about this. For the Zara line. We trace this line and we see it descends. We've got secular kings, Scandinavian, um, Merovingian. We've got pretty much Frankish, you name it. They all come out of that line. And we, to this date, still have someone that traces their lineage back all the way, at least to the throne of David, that being now what will become King Charles, I think he's taking the third is, is his title, who will be coronated on May 6th. And this is kind of interesting. He is counted as the 153rd uh, to be um, basically from Adam down to basically hold this position. So 153, which seems to be an important number somewhere. Or if you want, yeah, some of you got that. And then You've got the 40 years. He becomes the 40th monarch to take this position. I thought the numbers were interesting, 40 being the complete time of trial, and 153 being that number, that strange number of fishes in the New Testament that are brought up in the net. Who knows? Is there any relevance there? I don't know. I can go on a different sidebar. But the point is that there will still be somebody sitting on the throne who traces their lineage back. And I, that's not to say, by the way, that the English or British monarchy is the only one. And I say that with all due respect, because if you read the Old Testament, if you just look at David, David had a lot of women, lots. Let's see if I, he married Egla, Abital, Haggith, Maka, Abigail, Ahinuim, Bathsheba, and Michael. And that's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight that all have children born to them. And then there are another three, six, nine, there's another 10 children who we don't know who the mother is. And talk about problems here identifying. <laughs> it's like a take a paternity test. Uh, <laughs> Too bad Maury Povich wasn't around these days, huh? <laughs> um, 
but it's, it's interesting because we never stop to think, could any of the descendants of David that are not in the spotlight, that haven't gained the notoriety of the names, for example, we all know who Bathsheba is, but is it possible that any of the descendants of David, for example, could be sitting somewhere, descendants from these unions? The question is, we don't know, I have no idea. It's the same thing, by the way, with Solomon. Solomon's wives and concubines combined makes a thousand women, and I don't think that he was with a thousand women simply with his hands behind his back, <laughs> which tells you that there had to be children produced there. And we know there were children produced there. The union, Solomon and Sheba, producing Menelik. And I mentioned this, um, I believe, last week, that would basically be the line down to Halle Selesi, who claimed his lineage backwards the same way. So we don't know, if you think about it, there are probably a lot more descendants in the line of Judah that we cannot trace. They're floating somewhere out in the world, and probably to our surprise, if we were to be able to take monarchs of different countries in, we'll, we'll call it in another time, generations back, we might find these are the scatterings, if you will, of the descendants, the sons, immediate sons of David or of Solomon. And that's not limited to what happens after the kings that are appointed, as we, I previously said and showed you a list of the kings that ruled successively north and south until the final carrying away of the southern kingdom, which basically that line ends with Zedekiah. So here's the question, and, and I start the message this way. Um, in that passage I quoted out of Jeremiah, it basically says, if these things aren't so, then basically the covenant that God's made with the stars in the sky or the sun and the moon are not so either. So basically God's saying to Jeremiah, this will always be. Now there are people who would like to just say, well, see, we can't prove anything here, but the reality is we can. And as we've gone on this journey, I think the interesting thing is I've showed you enough through DNA, through archaeology, and I've tried to even pull in some of the things I've always said, even in mythology, you've got usually a kernel of truth that then is it shrouded in kind of this myth and mystery. So I've tried to bring it all together to show you that this is not, the Bible is not some uh, compilation of nice mythological fairy tales, but we have bits and pieces woven in of history. And it's the history of God's people. And this whole series brings about several main topics. The disobedience of God's people, the people who fancied themselves more spiritual than others, north versus south, People who could never learn the lessons, even if God showed up and appeared to them, they would not learn the lesson. And finally, maybe that God could actually have enough and get fed up of people, which he did. Now, luckily, God is gracious and loving and merciful. And we know from multiple passages in the Old and New Testament that God is not done. He is not done with Judah. And he is not done with the house of Israel. So that gives me hope, especially for those people that say, well, how could I fit into this equation? It gives me hope to say God is not finished yet. And this particular promise that's given, it's either true or it's not. So this is why I'm trying to set the historical pieces out there for us to follow. We began looking at, as I said, the last ruler in the southern kingdom. And I pointed this out. If you were to make a family chart, Jeconiah would technically be the last rightly appointed king. Zedekiah is uncle or brother and was appointed by the Babylonians and probably would not have succeeded uh, Jeconiah, Jeconiah's king. So that's one. The second part of this is to figure out, again, if Zedekiah sees his son's eyes, uh, he sees his children killed, his eyes are plucked out, he's led away and taken off to prison to rot somewhere, 
I also introduced something that I don't think we have an answer to either, which is Jeconiah was also taken away and with his wives and potentially with children. What happened to those people, which by the way would have also been a continuance of the line of the right to rule. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a, there's, it's not cut and dry here. A lot of people just want everything to fit in a nice little box and say, okay, it fits. It doesn't always fit. And part of the hardest part of this is picking up, as I left off last week, in a place where, um, like I said, we've, we've believed certain things. And as I've been researching, find out that they're not exactly the way we've believed them. So the, the fantastic story that we have believed is that the aged prophet Jeremiah sails off with Zedekiah's daughters. There is a reference to the daughters of Zedekiah within the book of Jeremiah. I believe it's Jeremiah 41. And they take off along with Simon Baruch, the scribe. Possibly there are, according to different legends and writings, there could have been up to five people, maybe more. And supposedly they transported the Ark of the Covenant, um, the Stone of Destiny, and there are other, actually other items that are chronicled as brought with them. Uh, a special sword, for example, which I happen to believe is where the legends of the, the Excalibur came from, all right, a sword that had power or whatever. So we looked at this last week, and I think I tried to show you with enough evidence and give you enough references from different material. And I really don't care what reference point you're going to use. If you use the four masters, if you use any, any, anything out there, you're going to find that the dates do not add up. And I can just say one simple thing here to make Jeremiah Olam Fala. He cannot be. Now, I know that some people were really disturbed at that, and I read your messages and deal with it, okay? It's like I was disturbed that Christmas wasn't in the Bible. Deal with it, okay? It is what it is. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't mean that the whole thing is not true. It means that there is, as I said, usually kernels of truth, and we have to go on a mission to fact find and gather evidence to the best of our ability. I will say this to you, and I want you to think about what I'm going to say. We know that there are two graves purportedly ascribed to the prophet Jeremiah in Ireland. So uh, just think about this. The likelihood of having a grave somewhere, just one grave, says potentially either legend that you were there or you were there, but to have two graves, it's kind of like the two graves of Christ, right? Where you, can, you don't maybe know which one is which, but one of them has to be the right one. I would go so far as to say that safely, yes, Jeremiah may have very well gone to Ireland because I don't know how you'd get two graves of a man who'd never been there. Okay? But there are some issues that I keep bringing up, and I'm bringing them up because we, I put, try to put flesh and blood on the Bible, and I try to make this make sense. So the first thing I want you to kind of take note of is that the date for the fall of Jerusalem, which, again, the numbers are all over the place. I say 586, somebody writes 587 or 580, I don't know. There's a little discrepancy in the dates, but I don't care what date, more or less within a year, two years, three years, you want to put to the fall of Jerusalem. If you take the list of kings that I showed you last week, and look on each list for the timeline that would be approximately, if let's just say the date is 586 BC, and Jeremiah, if he actually did go to Ireland, he's an old man now, figure that the journey there would be a long haul, and it would have to be in close proximity to the date that they either fled Jerusalem or fled Egypt, one of the two. Now, why do I point that out? Because if you go to the list of the kings that I showed you last week, uh, look at those names, and I began to research those names. Those are just the kings, okay? That doesn't mean that, that Jeremiah was a king, he's a prophet. But I started looking at the names of those kings. 
on both lists because they fall in different places and started doing research on all of these people at that time to see if maybe they, in their, because they kept good notes, that was really important. If you were a ruler somewhere, you always had a scribe taking down, probably exaggerating your feats, but taking down everything you did. So I started to try and research these people living in this Jeremiah's timeline because it would make sense to me that a king of that day would, would take note of a holy man or a wise man showing up with a couple of people from a faraway land, a big gold box, and a big old gigantic rock, if that's the case. Now, I can tell you this because it, it all kind of begins to come together. The likelihood that Jeremiah brought the stone of destiny is really slim, okay? The stone of destiny made it there, but it got there much earlier than what we've believed. And that part I may have kind of just slipped by you last week, so let me just say this real carefully. It is the son of Chalcol, Gathalus. He is the one that basically, he is not living in Egypt, he will come to Egypt, he retrieves the stone, he may or may not have left with the daughter of a pharaoh, that's another big question mark, but that's where the stone left and was taken. It could not have endured, I'm sorry, there's a lot of things we can, we can fabricate, but from all the material I've read, there's a lot of theories out there that if you start poking at them, they don't hold up. Even if you're trying to do it by faith, it doesn't make sense. So, what we have um, is a lot of information. Now, if you go to the secular records, say, not my favorite, but Britannica Online, for example, it says that Jeremiah died in 570 BC in Egypt. We don't know that. There's nothing in this book that says that, nor is there anything in this book that says that they went to Ireland. So your guess is as good as mine, but I'm gonna go back to this and say, if there are two graves ascribed to him, there's a very good probability he was there and a very good probability that one of those graves probably does contain his body. Now, will that change anything if he came as um, his, the prophet, if he came by another name, if he was known? It doesn't change anything. The fact of the matter is that God still accomplished his plan. And, you know, for, for those of you that are familiar with the rooting up and the planting, it seems that it would, take, it would have taken Jeremiah to leave where he was to plant once more, if you're familiar with the prophecy, uh, which we may or may not get to. So I think it's important for us to kind of keep all of this in mind. Um, we know that Jeremiah started his public ministry in Josiah's 13th year on the throne. So uh, when I say we can calculate his age more or less, we can. And I do find it incredulous, not impossible, but incredulous, that if Jeremiah was 70-some years old um, by the time Jerusalem fell, it's not improbable that he lived to 120, but the likelihood of him going off and becoming labeled as a king in a faraway land, eh, not so good. So. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned, Simon Baruch, who is actually mentioned in the book of Jeremiah, um, and we have good records for him. We go to the list of the kings, we see a name that's very similar to him. Is it the same person? No. But then again, the people who have conflated a lot of this, there seems to be this drive to just, as I said, make everything fit neatly in a package, box it up, and no matter how sloppy the findings are to say we found a solution that fits every person's boxes checked and now we can move on, it won't happen like that. So the thing that we can know, there are a few Irish records that say that sometime around 570 BC, again, all of these dates become sliding, that a holy man from the East came to Ireland. That could be anybody. Could be anybody. But I'll just leave that as an open question mark. 
Geoffrey Keating, the history of Ireland from the, its earliest period to the English invasion, um, published in New York, 1866, claimed that a person named Nimid, which in the old Irish, Nimid would be sanctified or holy, but that Nimid arrived in Ireland with 34 ships with a crew of 30 in each ship. This group led by Nimid, and the record says, along with Nimid, Stain, Yarbanel the prophet, Anid, and Fergus of the Red Side accompanied him. In the Book of Conquests, Yarbanel the prophet is referred to as son of Nimid. Now here is our great dilemma. We have a tradition, do you know, and I've talked about this, Mac or O in the Irish tradition is son of, meaning son of. A lot of these genealogies that were written, son of, take very much the same posture as the Old Testament. Son of can be immediate son of or a descendant of generations apart, I cannot say. The one thing we do know is, again, if I was going to try and pierce holes in this, Jeremiah could not, our prophet Jeremiah of the Bible, could not be the son, the true blood son of Nimid, unless Nimid's name, which in their language, in the Irish, Old Irish, means holy or sanctified, uh, has something to do with whoever he came with. But I'm going to leave that. I'm putting information out today that may or may not have answers to it. Um, but if we are going to look at the possible people that Jeremiah could be, Yarbanel lines up as probably the most plausible. There are others who have suggested that Phineas Farsa, who it said established many schools of learning uh, after he left Egypt, specifically at Daphne's, where that, when that tower was abandoned, there is a suggestion by Keating that says three sages, including, I believe, Phineas Farsa, um, held the chief direction of the great school. One of them is Phineas Farsa, Gedel, the son of Ethor, of the race of Gomer from Greece. And this name, which just appears, we've never heard of him before, Ka or Ca, the eloquent or just from Judea. And as you keep reading, it says Yar or Yarbanel, the son of Nimid. So they're referring to this individual Yarbanel as also Se or Ke, the just. So what is the connection here? If there is one, I'm just going to tell you. I, I can't tell you concretely and absolutely and unequivocally. I cannot. And I'll always be forthright with you. But if there is a person to match up to Jeremiah in the timeline of things, it is this person Yarbanel. And why Yarbanel? Okay, Jeremiah starts with a J, but in the Hebrew, his name would be Yerumiah. Now, you have Yar, like Yer, Yar, his first name, Ban, or Ben, son, El, of God. Yar, son of God. Is it possible that this is our missing Jeremiah? It's possible, but we won't ever definitively know that. I'm not going to stand here and tell you Definitively, this is him. I can't tell you definitively who he's not. And I think I established that last week. Um, now, we, I just looked with you this verse in Jeremiah 33, 17. And the reason why I think this is so important is because we're looking at descendants from the house of Judah, but the mention here, and remember I told you, sometimes house of Israel is referred to as Israel as a whole, sometimes referred to as the house of Israel proper northern kingdom. So I think it's interesting that we may be seeing right here in this verse somewhat of a bifurcation. Instead of simply focusing on the Pharaoh's line that stays within the Bible and all the descendants in the genealogy and Matthew's genealogy that take you down to the birth of Christ versus the Zara line that takes you off to these secular rulers who, by the way, unless I am sorely mistaken, none of these identified as Jewish. They either became Roman Catholic and known as Roman Catholic or eventually after the Reformation known as Protestants, period. Or if you want to go with the English, the Anglican Church. So there, there is good 
reason to analyze this and make sure that we are not missing anything. Uh, when I began studying on this subject, there were certain things I think I mentioned to you in heraldry, in imagery, uh, the animals, all the things. Each tribe has an identification. And a lot of these are kind of added on to a country where these people will essentially land. One of those things, for at least for Ireland, is the symbol of the harp and its use of the Star of David uh, on the flag of Ulster also cannot be a mere coincidence. So again, we have this kind of, it's a repetition. It's this flag is, look it up. You can see what it looks like on the internet. Very plain as day, we're looking at a flag that basically takes you right back to the Bible. So um, I think probably the big important message here is from those two children, the scarlet thread and that line that basically takes us through all of these different kings, um, I think what we come to see is that the Zara line that we know goes to Spain, um, names places like Zaragoza, and then essentially the, as we follow the migrations, they end up in these areas where we've been tracking all of the northern kingdom. So you're going to find spillover from the south peppered in with the northern tribes. Try and remember this, because this is the thing that it, people get so wrong. They think, well, the tribe of Judah comes back from Babylonian captivity, and those people that came back, which I think the number is probably 42 or 43,000, those people do not necessarily make up, we'll call it the bulk of what would later be known as Judaism. You've got to remember that people are going to come, and I've referenced this already multiple times. The Book of Esther says people were converting to Judaism, but that's after they came back from Babylonia. So it's important to remember that all of the people who belong to the southern kingdom who did not return, better to think of them even though they are line of Judah and we'll find them ruling in different places, better to think of them as part of the northern kingdom, non-Jewish, because that's how they end up in our history books. Pretty easy to see. Um, the dynastic lines that we've traced, I think we, we started with, when I went down this, we started with Darda, and then Darda, eventually we get to uh, Aenus, Aenus to Brutus. Brutus basically uh, comes on the shores of Britain, names the pla place after him, Briton, Brutus. His name is attached to it. It becomes actually New Troy, as he had come from Troy, becomes New Troy, which becomes London. And it is from this pivotal moment in time that we begin to trace the different kings. Now, what's interesting is I have this little book, Kings and Queen, Queens of England, um, Eric C. Detterfield. And this is kind of really interesting book because what it does is it gives you all of the, I was looking for where this was published, Weathervane Books, 1972. So it gives you each house, for example, this would be the Saxon house and its lineage. And if you've been listening to me, this is where it gets really good because we traced, for example, who are the Saxons? Then you start looking at who is sitting on the throne of this house, who is sitting on the throne, for example, in Mercia. You begin to pick this apart and you can see how all of these fragmented kings that will all have their own respective kingdom they all stem from this one source that we have been tracing, more or less, all right? So um, why is this important? Because as you start picking apart this history, you find clues. For example, when Brutus was sailing on towards the British Isles, they stopped in Spain. And it says there, four generations born to exiles from Troy were living in Spain. Brutus hooks up with another Trojan leader, Corinius, and together they basically set sail together. They build the capital, as I just referenced, New Troy, known as London. From this 
grouping. As I mentioned earlier, Scandinavian, uh, the Frankish, Saxon, they all trace their roots. So if you were looking at the list of kings, Malaysian kings, Frankish kings, all of these kings are going to stem from a common tree. That is enough for me to say, if somebody was looking at this promise given to Jeremiah, the promise was not, not made good on. The promise was kept. And in fact, the promise is still ongoing. This is the wonder of when you study God's book. You can, you can find a few things that you think are just random coincidences, but when you start to see God's hand over and over and over and over again, it's really faith-building, and it, it kind of opens your eyes to the reality that God is not this um, black and white ink on the pages here, but actually living, breathing, powerful, has his hand in history, making all of this come to pass. When we leave the tribe of Judah, and I think I might just do that right now, because you have enough information, for those, especially for those of you who want to keep pressing on, you can begin doing your own homework. There's enough information on the tribe of Judah in the few messages I've delivered that I think you could probably put enough of it together to figure out, along with what I've just said, the tribe of Judah that did not return basically will make up the bulk of our royalty sitting on a throne somewhere up until this present day. Okay, I'm going to move on because I, I actually think I want to finish up today, so I'm going to touch on a few different things I might not have touched on. Um, Benjamin. We know that Benjamin was clustered with Judah, um, and as so, you would also think that as they were clustered, you'd think they would always stay together. They were clustered in the south, but as we begin to find the tribe of Benjamin, we find that they are not necessarily with the tribe of Judah. They pop up for us um, as the people known eventually as Belge, Belgium, the people from Belge. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Now, they'll, they'll be peppered elsewhere, but that's the largest concentration of those people. So um, we have Benjamin pretty much popping up where we'll say it's a crossover area because there's going to be a lot of migration through those parts. And that will bring us actually full circle, if you think about it, because I've already taught on Reuben and the French, um, the different groups. So it should be clear then when William, the first or the conqueror, was uh, the, the Norman king of England, we kind of have a merger of all this because of the ter territory from where they came from. So it, now you're starting to see everything kind of being uh, compressed into a smaller and smaller circle with this particular event, which I think is 1066, but don't quote me on that. My dates may not be good. Um, as I said, if you are looking at the descendants of Benjamin, you will find the name Bella. That's where we get Bella or Bellaha, where we get those connections to Belgium. There's another son of Benjamin called Mupin. Um, he has been identified as Ptolemy as living east of the Caspian Sea. I don't think we had an identification on him, but Ptolemy says he identified him, those people as living there. Benjamin had 10 sons, so it's safe to say that these would have been dispersed in the territory that I've described. So think of the general area where Belgium is, along, peppered along with some of the Norman folks, so you can kind of see the area that I'm talking about. Um, there's a, one other group of people I got to slip in here before we call it quits. And I, I'm sorry to do this, but I just, I think this is probably a good point to just push all this information out. The Levites. The Levites, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, Merari, and we can trace the lineage from these, but as we know, Moses and Aaron, they begin that family that basically we can trace all of the priests more or less are recorded in this book for us. Do not make the mistake what most people do. They forget that the two brothers, uh, Simeon and Levi, engaged in a lot of violence. So think of Levi before Levi was 
and his family would have been put in that priestly position. If you remember, they went out to avenge the rape of their sister Dinah, and they killed a lot of people. So, you know, a lot of times people think the holy people chosen by God, they are spotless, they are perfect. Well, God had criteria, but you can see that there wasn't any priest at any time, even though there are specifications, that we could say they fit as perfection. No one did. Um, okay, last but not least, and I think this one's probably pretty interesting. If you remember, Jacob prophesied that Levi would be scattered. That is important because a lot of times I think people think, well, the Levites kind of stayed tucked in there with Judah and Benjamin. And some did. That's absolutely true. But not all. Now, you tell me if in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, which is at the close of the canon, 400 years before Christ, and we can see that the priests are basically still in disobedience. They're still not doing what God has asked. They're offering defective offerings. They're not being obedient to God. Do you really think that God would say, I'm just going to continue this pattern? Let's just keep going because I like to be, you know, um, sevened up. If you don't know what that is, don't, it's okay. You haven't been here long enough. Uh, basically, if you're that flippant towards God, God says, I'm expecting this of you, and you don't do what God says. So it goes without saying when you begin to look at the worship practices, the worship practices themselves that these Levites were responsible for. Some were singers. Some tended to the tabernacle or the temple. They all had responsibilities. Eventually, would be reduced down to basically a few activities and possibly singing once the sacrificial system was done away with. All of this becomes important because, you know, people will say, well, uh, where do the Levites go today? Now, don't you think it's interesting that the Levites, we like to try and tell people that they kept this perfect line. But they didn't. In fact, we've got enough information to show that not every person from that Levitical line was good. Some acted in disobedience. But my point is, if you were looking for those people today, you may actually find them not where you think. Let me, food for thought here. I think it's interesting that God prescribed a group of people who would be essentially responsible, apart from the high priest, would be responsible for the activities and the continuation of God's program on earth. Where did that program go? Anybody? Okay. So it, it certainly didn't continue amongst the Old Testament folks, because by the time you get to the New Testament, we know, for example, there were offerings offered in the temple. Um, the mother of Jesus, for example, offered an offering in the temple, but the practices as we know them ceased. So the question is, those people that God raised up for his work, for his service, for his word, you don't think that God has a way of picking those same people and making them basically his mouthpieces to propagate the gospel? I'm not saying all, but I'm saying it seems very plausible to me to see the connection as to how God would use people that were already basically programmed for one thing, except now it's something completely different. And I actually read a very interesting theory, which I'm, I'm not sure that I would uh, subscribe to, but some have even suggested that there is a lot of similarity. Wait for it. This will be controversial. There's a lot of similarity between synagogue practices and the Roman Catholic Church. Just think about that. When you think about the censors, and the skull caps and other practices that seem like uh, close by. Somebody has suggested that. I'm not sure that I could subscribe to that, but it's definitely an interesting thought nonetheless. Then there's something else that I wanted to bring up because these people, it says they were, some were singers, but you'd never really think of the Levites 
as warriors, would you? But there's actually a couple of scriptures that tell us that they were also warriors, which is shocking. And in 1 Chronicles 15, 16, uh, and also verse 28, there's an interesting thing. It says, And David spoke to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, harps, cymbals, trumpets, and the lifting up of the voice with joy. And there's one oddity in these musical instruments, and that is psalteries. If you look up the Hebrew word, it is nebel. Nebel is a skin or a leather bag for liquid. If you keep going and you look at the description, it really looks like a bagpipe. Okay, anyway, listen, I don't know. I'm just, I'm the deliverer of information. What the heck do I know? Because all this stuff kind of ties in. You might ask, that's an odd instrument too, don't you think? I mean, this, yeah, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, but th there, is, there are other factors to take into consideration in terms of the practices between the Levites and between perhaps those that were still in Jerusalem. And that would be the courses of the priests that were still in function and in operation right to the time of Christ. And we know this because the father of John the Baptist is serving in his course, the course of Abijah, which is why when people say, why would you say Christ wasn't born December 25th? Because it's through the course of the priest that we find out when the father of John the Baptist found out that he's going to be a daddy, and then just a few months later, we know about Christ from the New Testament. So that, there's your timeline there. But the courses of the priests that are in the New Testament are as close to, they may not be exact, but they are as close to the courses that were occurring in David's day. So I think this is, there's some interesting clues here for what we can know. When we know, for example, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and that all the services, all the practices that used to go on ceased. So the question that I'd like to just, it's something, it's rhetorical. I don't know that you can answer and say, yes, there's an answer for that. But if all the people who were raised up to serve in the temple, singers, the people who prepared the offering, the people who prepared certain vessels or did certain things. Now they do none of that. Perhaps they just sing or they do whatever. Where did they go? What was their purpose? I'm talking about those people. These are the people that came back after captivity stayed and generations later, all right, right down to 70 AD, the fall of Jerusalem. Where did these people go? Now, there are people that will say, well, maybe they fled to the mountains and took shelter in the mountains. Maybe they were all killed. History records for us pretty much that a good percentage of the people who were in Jerusalem at this particular time were slaughtered. And the bulk of the people who escaped were women, not men. So when people talk about population and people, and it's very clear to me that we don't know. We don't have a real road map for those people who escaped, but we can say with great certainty that those people more than likely did not return to Jerusalem. And think about then, I'm going to keep going on this line of thought. If you know how successive governments over the course of four or five hundred years invaded, seized Jerusalem, and controlled it, how long did it take in, mo in our modern time to create, quote unquote, the modern state of Jerusalem, or a modern state of Israel, rather, that if God had intended that, you might say, well, there's prophecy for that. That's correct, but maybe the prophecy belongs in the future. We can say, as I've said, Israel, modern day Israel is just a bookmark to save a spot for the most important epicenter of events that are yet to unfold in the future. So the reality is, I think all of this series, what it does is it helps me to understand that you can't put people and just say neatly it all fits in a box. We know that the people basically who fled, we, let's just talk about the first wave of people that fled before the children of Israel went into Egypt's bondage. And there were probably successive waves of that. And then you've got the children of Israel themselves leaving and going out of Egypt's bondage into and wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And if you keep looking at each of these groups, you see that it is 
really impossible to have this, what people have basically done, which is to say all of these people, even the people to the south, they still exist as Jews today. And the answer to that is no, they don't. The people who are existing as Jews today from the line of Judah, if one can trace their line, would be people who are adhering to the prescribed laws that God basically gave and said, keep these in perpetuity, which no one can, by the way. Then there are those people later on that we see that will convert to Judaism, like in Esther's day, like in the day of the Khazars that basically were not Jews and converted to Judaism. So I think what happens is people like to just put all this together and say, see, all of these people referencing one particular group, for example, uh, the Levites, and they say, well, these people are identified in, in the world today as Jews. They cannot be. Not all of them. A portion of them, yes. A portion of the people of the tribe of Judah, yes. So the question comes up then, how does, how does this make sense of how does, how does this all work? You read what Malachi 3 says. It says there is a a reference between Malachi 3 and Zechariah 12 says the sons of Levi will be the first to be purified according to what Malachi says. That tells me that God will have the ability somehow to sort these people out and these will be purified first and then there's a whole category of people I guess a prescribed method God will use but these are the people so don't think they've just disappeared. Nor should we think that these people will reappear when God raises them up necessarily as Jewish. I think I have more than proven as we've watched all of these migrations that the vast majority of these people within one to two generations, they lost touch of their language, they lost track of their culture, there were certain vestigial remnants of their past that they may have remembered or oral tradition perpetuated, but by and large, as it was said about these people, they would not know, they would not remember who they were. And as I'm saying to you, there is good reason to believe that a good chunk of the South goes with it, goes with the North in we don't know exactly, although we've identified to the best of our ability. So coincidence says that no matter what, these people would all line up here We'd have, uh, you know, the, the Levites are going to appear here and the tribe of Benjamin is going to appear here. It's not going to be like that. They're scattered everywhere. Like we looked at the tribe of Dan, scattered everywhere. We looked at the tribe of Reuben, scattered in France. There are sections of places. And this is why when we get to prophecy, especially Ezekiel, Daniel, and the book of Revelation, it becomes important to know the territories that basically God is... He said nothing like that. He's, these are territories of the apple of my eye. He hasn't said that, for example, about the land of God, but he said that about the land of Israel, specifically about Jerusalem. There are certain things we can absolutely know. So if you put all this together, it should do a couple of things here. This tapestry woven from God's book should tell you that God, yes, he will raise up. We will have people from every tribe that will be raised up at the last day um, for those people who are worried about how will God know. I think that God can figure that out if he knows the number of hairs on your head and it says he sees the sparrow fall, I'm sure he can figure this out. And the takeaway from this entire series, not just that God's in control, but I want you to think of the crisis the drama, the trauma, whatever you've dealt with, let's just say for the last year. And you're just starting a new year, looking ahead, and you might think there's so much uncertainty. There's the financial uncertainty. There's the uncertainty of our nation. There's so many different things I can't really be sure of. But if you look back and you see God's control, especially just even in history, in your history, even in the last year, you see God's control that he brought you through this series, more than anything, tells me God is faithful, and he's going to bring to pass his word. His word of promise is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I don't have to think for a minute what will happen, because God's word 
I believe is true, and he's given me this certainty. So for those of you who maybe listened to all this uh, talk on the Lost Tribes, hopefully what this does is A, gives you the curiosity to keep digging because there's plenty more to mine out of here, and I'm sorry to bring this kind of throwing the last bits at you like that, but it's kind of time for us to move on from here, and I really think that for those that are uh, desiring to do a deeper study with the materials that I've referenced, and those are pretty good to start with. You can probably spend a lot of time reading. Some of these chronicles are very lengthy, they're very verbose, but they fill in a lot of the blanks. And then you turn and you look at history. If you're really not sure how to follow this backwards, start basically with what's, what, what we know of modern day, what exists today. And you can go all the way back, if you were tracing, for example, the kings, you could go all the way back from today and at least probably to the fifth century England to Egberg or Ethberg, whatever, the first king um, in, in the 500s, somewhere around there. With certainty, that's with certainty. And then you get kind of beyond that and you've got to start piecing things together. But minimally what it does is it shows you God's had his hand on these people, on these lines, on these tribes, on us. Specifically, the fact that if you read that scripture once more where it says there'll never be a time when a seed of David is not sitting on the throne of the house of Israel, it might be clear that God's word truly is. You know, if that said Judah, by the way, I'd have to conclude and say to you, it has to be Christ alone. But the fact that we have that bifurcated line tells me these two lines, one is what I call the bookmarker, until he who comes, it is his right to rule and to reign. Now let me ask you something, final question. If God has been in control of all of that and he's made it all come to pass, and I'm not gonna say it all unfolded perfectly, and it all came to pass in neat little segments. But if he could do all of that, do you think he's able to take care of you in this next year? Yes, sir. And look out for you? Yes, sir. And send his angel in front of you? Yes, sir. That's what I think too. I really hope that this teaching uh, will inspire, because I've seen enough of you sending me letters to inspire you to do your own study and to dig deeper. Because the more you dig on this subject, the more you find that there's so much more to mine out. And I just decided, I was vacillating whether I finish or not today because I realized we could keep going on this indefinitely. We could be lost in the lost tribes. <laughs> and we've got a lot of Bible territory to cover. So hopefully you'll be here next week when we take up a completely different subject. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Like I said, I think I could keep going here for another 20 weeks. but. All good things must come to an end, at least temporarily. So I leave you with this. I hope you have a wonderful uh, New Year day. And uh, notice that. And then um, I guess I will see you all here next week. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.